Our guest for this session is CADA engineer, Beatrice Terer. Um, Beatrice, welcome to the Mahandisi family. Thank you. This is where we talk about what matters to the engineers. So, um, you are SCADA engineer with Ketako. Please talk to us about how you came to be involved with SCADA, with SCADA Works. Okay. I'll start by defining what SCADA is. SCADA is Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Uh, so, we have different SCADA systems that uh, work in different sectors like water, there's power, and uh, what I'm working on right now is transmission SCADA, substation SCADA in transmission stations. So what uh, SCADA does is ideally collect every information from the field level, process level, up to the station level. From the field level, by field level, I mean from the circuit breakers, isolators, transformers, and then it col it collects all the data to the centralized SCADA system where you have all the information. You can see the graphics on how the status of what is on the field. For example, if the breaker is open or closed, if it's operating in remote or local, and then the information of the status of how the system are. If there is any issue, you can see there and also events, how the events are coming up. So ideally SCADA is supposed to collect every information, put it in a centralized place, and you can use it at that centralized place without going necessarily going to the field to see what is happening there. All the information that you need can be, can be collected from there, from a centralized position. And this centralized position is the SCADA station as well as the national control where the whole grid is being controlled by the Kenya power. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the um, description of what SCADA is. In, I mean, for the layman, so it's a good um, summary of what it is. So you were trained as an electrical engineer, as you mentioned. And um, now, how did you, you, how did you come to be involved with SCADA? What was your journey? So, I trained as a SCAD, as an electrical and communications engineer. Then I started working with a, a contractor who works for who worked with with Kenya Power to do the designs of the low low voltage lines. After that, an opportunity came at Ketrako where they were employing engineers, and I applied. I was uh, fortunate enough to be called. And uh, during the orientation period, one of the engineers who was there was uh, giving a description of what they do within the company. And she happened to, to be working under SCADA. And I, from the interaction we had with her, I developed interest to, to join the SCADA system. Fortunate enough, the, the company employed me specifically for communication because my degree read electrical and communications engineer so I I was employed to do SCADA and telecommunications, and that's how I I found myself doing SCADA and telecommunication within our within our company. Yeah. So you transitioned from uh, working for a contractor, uh, but you were doing the same thing to the contractor within low voltage, or this was more of like an upgrade. No, I was. There was no SCADA works when you were working with the contractor? No, there was no SCADA works. SCADA was even new to me when I joined the car, the company. All I knew was electrical. I, I had never heard about SCADA before. But now this is in this company is where I learned about SCADA and I grew in SCADA. Yes. This is, now that is interesting because um, your approach to how you transition to the next stage is, is very, um, it's a good way because now you, you might think that some people sometimes get, you you fear sometimes when you are supposed to transition and okay, I do not know this, uh, it's only that I've heard of it. Or is it, the, what was your approach actually? Was it, okay, we will, we will try and know when we get in. Now that you didn't know what it was and now you're getting the position. So when I joined uh, the SCADA, the SCADA team, it was also in its initial stages. It was not something that was established. 
So it's like we were learning together with also the engineers that were there. So it was a good opportunity because you see, we, we are working with the other contractors who are who are supposed to implement the same in our projects. And uh, the best way, as I always say, the best way to learn is to learn from someone who knows these things. So we were fortunate enough to to develop relationships with the with the, the contractors, and uh, they they were able to teach us and also. Our self-initiative to learn more about these systems is the, is what helped me as a person to understand what SCADA is. So ideally, I came from not knowing anything into knowing a lot about SCADA through my interaction with the with the with the contractors as well as with the engineers who were there before me. For the period that you were supposed to learn about SCADA, were there trainings that you attended? Um, was it company sponsored or it was more on your initiative? So, uh, what happens if you join Ketraco? What happened when we when I joined Ketraco? We were taken to a, a comprehensive training for transmission system where we learned from all the way from uh, uh, construction, the civil works, up to the transmission towers, how to design them, how to design a substation. Now up to the details of sub of the SCADA system, but this now this is this was more of an information base because it you cannot learn everything within twelve weeks, but it it formed a basis of what we 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 needed to know as we we worked along. So the the training the the initial graduate training was very helpful in the in my case. So where we learned the basics of SCADA and the whole thing, the whole picture of what a SCADA does and in relationship to the whole thing of the transmission network. So as we went, as when we, we, we came back and went along, we, was, we, we worked, I worked with the, the contractors where I learned a lot. And also during the, in those projects that we are given, there is also a training component that is always geared to towards the specific needs. And one of them was SCADA system. And so there's several training that you go because we have different systems from different vendors. So this means every time there's a new vendor that comes in, we have to be tested to be trained on the same. And this is, this is what co the company does for us. They also give us training for the same system that the new, any new system that comes in the market. So these trainings are company sponsored. Yes, they are. They are company sponsored as well as the financial sponsored, because we are sponsored also by the World Bank and AFD. Ah, okay, okay. So, um, so your role when you got in, so you're employed first time. You've gone for two weeks training. Um, so you came and you are reporting to a senior engineer. Yes, I was reporting to an electrical engineer who was now my supervisor. Where I'm supposed to to give to give in reports every two weeks of what I have learned so far. And it was not uh, when I came in. I, you are not supposed to just learn SCADA. You're supposed to learn everything within a substation because you are best. You're given there are several projects that are going on. You have to be there from the from the earthing level up to when the, the, the substation is fully commissioned. So you have, at first I had to learn everything before now I, I came to specialize into SCADA. So if you learn everything, even uh, how to deal with the people, people who are affected by the project. You have to speak to them and communicate to them and uh, manage them because they are, they are part of the stakeholders within the with the energy sector. So we had to learn, I had to learn everything. You cut across civil, electrical, primary equipment, protection system, everything. Yeah, and stakeholder management, yeah. Okay, so, um, so if I understand what you're saying is that you went for a training for 12 weeks and then from this training, uh, we are a bit general, so we need to understand everything that goes on within the um, your scope of works in quotes. And then now 
before you specialized to exactly what the company hired you for. So could you could you tell us how long was this period probably? Did it take like one year, two years, uh, 18 months? Before you got to a position where, okay, now I am confident, give me my scope uh, clearly. So this took around one and a half years. One and a half years where you you actually do everything. You actually do everything and learn everything. You're expected to do everything and report every two weeks to your supervisor. And uh, she measures your progress, gives you uh, feedback. Yeah. Ah, okay. So now, when in this period that you are reporting to your boss, what was the relationship like? Is it was it more of like um, you are reporting to a boss, or was it cordial? Like, okay, it is you who goes. Okay, boss, I have it here. This is what I have done. This is the report. This is where I feel inadequate. I need help here. Or it was more of like um, when the two weeks are over, you come and discuss what you have done. No, it's uh, it was a combination of the same. It, it when it needed to be very professional, it became very professional. If it needed to be a bit casual, it was casual. But now, as I as I as I've said, we it's a relationship where you're you're both learning also because things were not just it was uh, new things for all of us. Yeah. So so we're talking about your relationship with your boss, and uh, you're saying that. Uh, when it needed to be professional, it was professional. When it needed to be casual, it was casual. But um, about how you were able to work within the projects and, and handle, handle stakeholders, knowing very well that you are coming from a position of um, uh, this equipment or these items here are still new to all of us, but then we have requirements that we ought to meet I'm assuming that you were the point person as far as the company is concerned. So you're the eyes of the company and you are the one who has worked on the designs, probably. Uh, how, how, was the, how, was the, how did you work around that? How did you manage to speak to this group? Because someone can dispute what you're saying for the reason that they, they imagine you're still new. Somebody could say, okay, what you're saying is theoretical. But this is what we want to do, akin to what Kenyans really do. Sometimes when people want to take shortcuts, yeah. So uh, when I'm working back then, when I was working with a pro, with a contractor, I was not working alone. It was a team of engineers, not just me as the the, the person who is on forefront. No, there's a project implementation team that is present there who are assigned to that project. Me as an as a junior engineer that I've come in, I have I I just uh, most of the of the of the stuff I do is under supervision of the the engineer who is in charge in that project. You see, so if there is anything that I was asked that is not within my scope, I'll have to refer the the contractor to the to the project lead, to the project engineer that is there. So. All this time, within the, the one and a half years, I was working under other senior engineers who were in charge of the project itself. So personally, I will not make a decision for the company in that position. Ah, okay. That, that answers it. Because I was wondering, um, you're supposed to make a critical decisions and sometimes you might be unsure. Um, and, and, and talk to us a little bit about how you would escalate a very serious uh, um, situation that requires the decision of your, of your apply. How was the process? Would you write it down? Would you, um, I mean, pen it down on a piece of paper, uh, write to your boss via email? How, how, was, how was the escalation there? So when I was a graduate engineer, what what normally what normally happened is uh, the 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 senior engineers were actually readily available within the the site to to discuss any matters that arises. So it depends with uh, where that the engineer is at the moment. If he's available, I'll just call on him within the site and let him handle the issue 
in my presence also because I it's an opportunity to also learn. But now if the engineer is not available at site, I'll have to write an email and uh, explain the issue to him and wait for his uh, decision to be made from his end. Alternatively, if it's something that it is very urgent, it was just a phone call away. So combination of this, all these factors and also what situation we are in at that moment helped us to helped me to know how to escalate the issue at that moment. Okay, so it was more a hands-on experience. Uh, you get there, things are not according to design. There's an issue, contractor is saying this, it's supposed to make a decision. You ensure escalate to the boss. The, the, the um, this feedback, um, iterate on the feedback, and then the works progress. So the other the, the, the thing also that comes out of that also is something to do with how do we manage the changes within the project. So when when it comes to changes, that is, it's the decision of the project manager to make the changes, especially the changes that will affect the project in a big way. It is the decision of the project manager. If I'm if I'm present there and the changes needs to be done and there is a senior engineer, I explain the same to the senior engineer. But the decision lies with the project engineer, with the project manager, but informed by the engineer at site. Because these decisions are not just made by the engineer himself also. The, the engineer informs the decision to the project manager. And now the project manager decides if we can go with this or we stick to what it was supposed to be. So that the, the final say lies with the project manager. Okay, uh, very interesting. So, so if the project manager is not necessarily... Um, but I'm assuming that the project manager will have gone through the whole of this process, as you've said, whether you are an electrical engineer who wants to do SCADA or you want to um, take a certain area that you want to focus on, you will still have to go through the overall training for the whole project so that you understand what goes on within the project. Uh, so that in the times that you become a project manager for all of this project, you understand how everyone, uh, how the various components within the project uh, come together. I'm assuming that is the way it, uh, it works. Yes, yeah, that's that is how it works. <laughs> yeah. So a bit is now comes in 12 weeks of training, one year, um, let's say two years actually of training. Now you're in a position that you're able to pick on greater tasks. Uh, we call it greater responsibility. Um, how was it for you? Is it like you, you, you go to a position where you sought for, you're promoted because of the time that you have been there or you sought for the promotion in terms of asking for it? So that's a tricky question. But I would say this. It was more of a devolved, devolved responsibility. After one and a half years, now the responsibility that you're given is more. For example, I'm now... I'm now in responsible for the commissioning of a substation, the, scat, the scatter scope of the commissioning of a substation. So uh, as time went by, I was now left with a, for example, if there's a project that is going on, you're told, which is now you're in charge of this substation, make sure it is commissioned until it is energized. And you're in charge of that. And that goes on. So it was more of a, Respons added responsibility. It was not <laughs> promotion kind of. It was a re responsibility that is now defined. You're not just doing everything. You're doing specific things that you're assigned to, to, that is assigned to you. Now, you know, if you come from the private sector, sometimes that is what it means. <laughs> but um, uh, fair enough. So would, would you, do we have like a way of saying the, the magnitude of the work that you have done? For example, you would say you've done um, SCADA works of this. Is there a way of quantifying the SCADA works that you have done? Yes. <laughs> there, there is a performance targets and performance contracts, yes, that we fill every every year. So, and there is, a, there is a elements that you need to check and see, uh, have you achieved them? For example, there's there's need for you to design. 
projects that are coming up. You, are, you need to, to have designed, you need to have uh, done the configuration of the RTU, the gateways. You need to have commissioned some substations. You have to, you make reports. Those are some of the elements that you check within the, with, within the, the performance contract. And there's uh, measurements on, uh, there's how you measure, quantify what you've done. So for example, every year you're supposed to have designed a, a, at least two substations that are coming up. You're supposed to have commissioned two to three substations. The whole process, you've carried on all the whole process from 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 the from when the the equipment are installed in in the site up to when the substation is fully energized so that, those are some of the things they look we we look at during the performance writing the performance contract for us so you said you are supposed to have uh, uh, done the design you're supposed to have participated in the construction and you're supposed to have commissioned and also energized so what happens in a situation where we are unable to get the the, the irreducible minimums in quotes of the two projects that uh, we are saying? It or it is in, or it cannot be possible that uh, one can miss the project. So far, it has been impossible to me to miss because we have a lot of projects going on at the moment. But I would say there is also the aspect of uh, making, as as the years passed by, there is the aspect of ensuring that the system is available over 99.9% of the time. So this is also a big chunk of the of the performance contract, part of the things that are expected from you, so that you see if there is a blackout in the country, how fast will the SCADA system be able to restore the the blackout? That is also that that also matters because there is a you see when the the substations that we have they are controlled remotely at the national control center. It only stops working if there is an issue at the station level, and that one also contributes to your performance at the end of the year. So. Those are the, the other things that as the years go by, you, you see the, the, the weight of the projects, maybe the design projects reduces, but now the weight of uh, availability of the system throughout the year increases. You see? So it depends. Each year, there's, there's always some, some changes that is being done on the performance contract to align with the needs that are there that year. This is interesting because if, if you design the if you design the substation and it is still within your scope uh, when it transitions to maintenance, then um, you really understand what goes on. You really know exactly what uh, you can troubleshoot even in your sleep. Okay, probably I do not have internet connection. Probably I do not have this. You can see it. Uh, it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing actually. And. Um, um, yeah, so, so let's talk about the, the, the projects that you have done. Let's talk about the projects that you have done that you are proud of. Um, for, uh, for example, you could say, I did a substation in this place. This is what I liked about it. This is what um, I'm proud of. It is, it is. Okay, this, uh, this one substation is called the Senior 400 KV. It's the first 400 KV in the country. And I was uh, actually spearheading the team, the SCADA team that uh, was doing the project there. So it happened that during the pandemic period, the contractors had gone gone to the for for their leave for some break, for their some some celebration. It was the Indian celebration. So most of the workers within the substation had left the country during the pandemic period. But now there was this challenge. Uh, the works have have stopped, and now nothing can go on. And you know we have a contract with them. The works need to be done, and uh, time is running. So what I personally did, I approached the contractor and told him, "Why don't we do this on our own? We can do it, but now with the help of your specialized team in outside the country, we can be on call on, with them. They, if we need them." They can help us to to troubleshoot some issues if we have any issues. So, 
I, I would say I'm really proud of that substation. It was the first 400 kV in the country. I, together with my team, we were able to commission it. We, we configured it. We did the softwares, the graphics, the configuration at every stage of the SCADA system until we energized to the, we, we commissioned and successfully integrated it to the National Control Center, me and my team. So that is one of the stations that I'm proud of and uh, everything is working fine and we were able to even energize. So it's a big mom. It was a big moment for me and uh, yeah, and it was very successful. And also the the team that we're working with learned a great deal. You see, it is different when you, you just supervise and when you're working on it yourself. So when you're working on it yourself, you get to actually even realize the important things that you need to do. For example, uh, that is when we I, I realized SQL server has to be running all the time. If it stops running, it means all the all the data that you need to, to have is not there. If it's compromised, the SCADA system is compromised. There is where I learned that you need to take backup of your system every single day before you make any other changes because anything can happen and you have to revert back to the the backup that you are using. So it was a very big moment for, for me because I learned a great deal. It is one of the projects that propelled me to even more confidence in my current situation as a SCADA engineer. How happy can an engineer in Kenya be when we hear that um, one of our own is able to do such great works? Um, at, at any point, did you require the help of um, the guys outside? Yes. yes. You see, I've, as I was saying, we, we, have, we have different systems, di different SCADA systems in the country. It is not, it is not just a, a BB, Siemens, uh, GE, we have very different systems that we have. So in that specific substation, is the only substation that we have. We we have implemented a product called Siemens C, C Compass from Siemens. It was a new product. Of course, the, the the working is almost similar, but there are a few things that you need to to know that is different from other products, and that is where we, you need help from. The outside experts, but now because of the nature of the work, they 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 were busy at some point. So some of the time, that time of some of the times you had to figure out yourself, go to the internet, do research, make sure that everything is working correctly. Then you come back, eh? So you there was need also to do our own initiative, our own research, and uh, compile the information, then come back. So it was not just a smooth sailing. You had challenges. You had to face it, do research, then come back to work on it. Sometimes the, the, the experts are busy somewhere else. You cannot wait on that expert to finish whatever he's doing for you to continue. So you had to do research. You, yeah. So, and those are the things that built our muscles in terms of SCADA. Yeah, it's just like riding a bicycle. You cannot really say you've, um, you know how to ride the bicycle if you have not taken the time to do it yourself you cannot learn you cannot do it in theory and that's why um when when the most yeah when the most significant of the most um knowledgeable members of the team are not available in situations where need arises then it's a way of telling the junior guys to stand up to the task and um the beautiful thing about this is that you had to take time and really understand the system do the research where you unsure uh, it's a new product, uh, read more about it, understand it, so that when you implement, you know exactly where, uh, what goes into where and what is more important than um, th that you need to take care of. Um, so so other, than, other, than, other than the uh, specialized team being outside the country, are there challenges that you have seen uh, in the implementation of that project that required... Um, your intervention. So, in this particular project, uh, I think one, you see, one of the the challenges that we previously had. This is more into define fine fine details, but now 
one of the challenges we had in other projects is when, for example, we are, we are, we are trying to control the circuit breaker from the field level. Uh, sometimes it fails to, to operate. We're trying to, to push a command to the field level and it's not operating. So one of the things that we, we were able to, to correct in this, uh, in, in the current in this project, we we're able to to visual to do the visuals for the for the logics. I don't know how to put it in layman's language, but there's logics that de, that uh, there's some conditions that are supposed to be met before you are able to operate a circuit breaker. So what we did, we made sure that the logics, those conditions, we did it visually. So that if you have a problem operating a circuit break at the at the station level, you're able to come to the visuals of where the logics are and tell, oh, okay, maybe the spring is not charged. Maybe the one of the trip coils are, is failed. You see? So this is now the information now came out easily, even for the operators once we left the substation as the, the implementation team. Once we left the substation, the operators are able to see to, to actually troubleshoot the situation faster because we have done this on the graphics and they can be able to see which exactly is the problem. But previously in other substation, you could not even you can you could not tell faster because there were no there was no graphic. So this is one of the things that we we implemented uh, based on the feedback from the operators that we. We have in our sub in other substations. Ah, okay. Is it like it was because of the new products, or it was more on the um, your initiative? That okay, so this is the problem that you are having. Let us find a way of uh, solving it. Y yes, it was it was an initiative because we have had this problem in other substations, in other projects. So in this place where where now we we had the liberty to to actually add something without asking the contractor for change of scope, change of, because we are the ones who are doing it. So it was easy to implement what what we wanted. That sounds like a departure from uh, the normal norm where the contractor handles so much of the work, and now we, you have transitioned the work to the team in-house. Would you, would you recommend this approach going forward? Would you say for engineers who are working out there, it's best if the, the team that implements it is more involved? rather than waiting for the contractor to, rather than actually supervising the contractor. Because sometimes when you supervise, as you as you are actually put it correctly, is that there are certain elements within the project that you may not be able to see for the reason that you only supervise. You're only waiting for when, when things work. But now when things do not work, there are lo there's a lot of learning that goes in. There's a lot of confidence to be um, gotten once you solve the challenge. Would you recommend this approach going forward? I would say this was special because of the circumstances, but now the contractual issues that come up during the the implementation of projects is what will will inform the project on how to deal with it. That being said, I would say when you're working with contractors and supervising them, develop a relationship with them such that you're also able to work with your hands within the project, but now with them taking up the responsibility. It is more of uh, how you relate with the, the people. It is people's skills, I, I must say that. It is the people's skills because uh, for a contractor to to actually entrust you with the work that he is responsible for, he has to have trust in you. And that comes only when you relate well with those people that are working with you. So you are not just a supervisor. You're also a, a, a colleague, a team member. You're working towards the same goal, and that is how you. So the, no matter how, if it's the these contractual issues and all that, no matter all those all the, the obstacles that comes with, of course, the contractual laws, you can always find a way to balance between being a supervisor and being part of the team and living well with others, and that is how you survive and learn also, because you show them you need to learn, and they will help you learn and you will work on the project. So it depends with the situation and also how well you relate with the people. Yeah, so it is your people's skills and how you relate with them is more important. Now, yes, um, very important. Yes, so you, you, you have come from a background where you have worked with a contractor. 
now you've gotten into a situation where you're supervising these contractors. Uh, so the question is, have you found yourself in a situation where you have a difficult contract? Yes, I have. Uh, during, I, I would say during my my initial days as a supervisor, when now when I st- I was I started being responsible for maybe commissioning of a substation, uh, it was those days that you there's a new product that has come in, new system that has come in, and uh, you are trying to 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 learn the system as well as supervise the contractor doing the system. So, of course, you will meet at a point where you brush shoulders because he feels that you don't know and you're the person who is uh, supervising me. But now how what happened is uh, I realized it it works well when uh, when you 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 try to 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 be friendly to them. You see? You are friendly. You are you are also learning from them. And at that point, you're also supervising them. You see? You, you understand? You have to, to, to gel well with them. If there is a conflict, you what I did is uh, uh, step back a bit, analyze the situation, and uh, change my approach of, what I'm, of how I'm going to deal with this. Because I, I don't want to lose the relationship. I don't want to lose the 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 relationship with this person i want to work well with this team it is always nice to work with someone who you feel you can work together well so if there is a conflict you step back a bit change your approach and then come back and uh, deal with the situation yeah if you need help now if uh, if now there is there is need for help sometimes you can be arguing on something that you're not really informed you have to step back, go get information about this particular issue so that when you come to face the contractor, you are knowledgeable. You're not coming from place of ignorance. Eh? So that is how I approached. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> There's this particular project that I was working with a contractor back then. Uh, he used to dismiss me when I, I, I tried to tell him, no, this is not how we do it. But now I realized it's because uh, he feels I don't know. You see, but now we were fi- we are fighting against time. So I, I, I majored on what, what really, we, what was urgent at that moment. So we had to commission the project and make sure it is because we needed to energize the substation within a few days. So we had to major on the majors and leave the minors aside. But now we were not doing just one project with this contractor. We had another project and we still have like two other projects. But by the time he came for the next project, he I, w- I had already earned my place. I was not dismissible because <laughs> I had, you see, it, it was between... Uh, between uh, pandemic and post-pandemic. And you see, I had worked on this project, uh, a senior project. I now had confidence in what I'm saying. If I'm, I'm making a decision, it was out of knowledge. It was not just out of a requirement. It was out of knowledge. So by the time I was working with him on the next project, we were in good terms. We were friends. We were knowledge buddies. We could exchange ideas. And uh, so... You, I think what I would say, you have to, to be knowledgeable in your field for you to earn the respect that you need to have with with the contractor. As, and once you earn the respect, don't be condescending. You need to be accommodative and uh, let them not feel weird now that you're knowledgeable. No, you now, now that is where you get the power to be friends even more because you know what your staff, he knows you know, now you can... You can exchange ideas. Wow. Yeah. So, um, you know, when, when you are, when, when you speak confidently from a position of ignorance, that is called confident ignorance. And uh, sometimes people can argue so much about that for the reason that uh, it's more, of, it's more actually more of uh, ego and um, trying to prove that you know. But it's good that you went from the position of not, uh, for him feeling like you do not know to a position that now he thinks 
that you know what you're saying, which is a good thing actually. Um, now, um, talk to us a little bit about your people management skills. So, uh, at uh, at the moment, my my role is actually twofold. I've I've spoken about it. Uh, it's project management as well as operation and maintenance. And uh, this SCADA, uh, the SCADA department actually works for both the project team and also for the operation and maintenance. And these are the teams that there are people working under me, the graduate engineers, the technicians. So how we how I deal with things if there is a, a, a breakdown that needs our, my my attention, okay? I assign it to one of the team members and our our... Our approach is you cannot go to the field alone because most of the works are not in the headquarters. You have to go with a partner for security reason. Also. So you assigned two people. I assigned two people to go work on the task. If the the, the task is is uh, if they 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 encounter any challenges during the implementation of the same, our my culture within my team is you can ask you can ask for help from anyone you can ask from you are part of the the uh, team members that we have or you can call me directly so the, the 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 help can come from your team members fellow graduate engineers or me you see and then we can resolve the issue together so the delegation is there you have there is a problem you are given the i give the task to someone and give it in, you are in charge of it. One is in charge. The other one has to accompany them because it is good to work together for learning and also for security purposes. Yeah. So uh, what I what I what I foster within my team is to make sure that everyone works with the the other one and uh, and make sure that the task has been fulfilled. My 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 only objective is to make sure that uh, the job has been done. At the end of the day, all I need to know is that the job has been done. Having the best people skills, having good communication skills, having uh, gelling together as a team helps in resolving issues related to work. Because at the end of the day, it's work that has brought us here. Yeah. Yes. Words of wisdom from a manager, and um, yeah, you know sometimes when you're in a project, there the, the are challenges that comes as as uh, far as uh, one is that the way work is delegated, and sometimes the deliverables are not very 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 clear. So my interpretation as your junior might not be the expected end result that you have communicated. So sometimes when this breakdown of communication brings challenges within a project. But fair enough, you assign the project to one of your junior staff members and then there's a team, now they can exchange ideas. And then you, at the end of it all, you look at the output, which is a good approach. So now, over 45 minutes into the um, session, now as we move towards closure, would you say that you are fulfilled in the role, in, in your work that you have done, being a SCADA engineer? Do you think it's a fulfilling career for you at this point? I would say yes. I I I stepped into SCADA engineering without knowing what SCADA is. But right now I'm really passionate about SCADA. I I actually love my work. I would say that I could see the impact that it has had. You see recently we commissioned the the HVDC, the first HVDC in the country from Ethiopia to Kenya. We commissioned this and you see after every project has been commissioned i'm the last person standing within a substation making sure that this this substation is is in has been integrated safely to the national control you see and the national control is able to make a decision from what from the information that i'm giving them from the from the station level you see this this has helped me feel like i am helping the country you see because if it's if it's the issue of blackout it is our system that is being used to restore it 
very fast. Not like before where you had to look for a team, go to the field and call them to work on one by one substation. It has just been, it is now a, a matter of pressing a button and the, the operation is done seamlessly. So I would say I'm proud being a SCADA. I'm proud of being a SCADA engineer and making and uh, being impactful to this country. Ah, good to know. <laughs> Very few engineers uh, who are practicing sometimes say they are proud of what they are doing. But um, yeah, knowing very well that you're also helping the country and solving critical problems is, is a good element to have as part of your fulfillment. So um, we know now, we also know that Beatrice, you are a family um, lady. How, how is your work-life balance? What are the things that are working for you that you will recommend? I would say to maintain life work balance uh, i would say i have a very good support system at home eh? <laughs> i have uh, my husband is supportive of what of what i'm doing i have my house girl who is also helping me in what i'm doing so you see at the end of the day if you have support system that has, they are cheering you on in what you're doing even at the place of work it feels you are at peace, hmm? especially if you're getting support from your partner. You're at peace because you, if you leave your children, you know, they will be well taken care of. So having a support system is very important and also having a life, <laughs> having a life apart from work. You have to have friends that energize you, that uh, cheer you on as you also do your thing so yes i have friends that support me have good good uh, good boss good leaders that surround me so if there is any issue that you need to go and and, uh, and attend to that is family related the my boss is not hesitant to give you the permission because he knows at the end of the day you will deliver so it is uh, I would say having a good boss, having good uh, uh, good support system from the family is very important. That is how you maintain your work life balance, and also having friends that now pulls you out of from from work and uh, puts you in the friend zone, which is good. Okay, um, now because you know you cannot choose a boss. I don't know say I want a, a good boss. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think that can be answered by the question of um, maintaining good relationships, um, being focused on the outcome of the work so that your boss also does not have, because it's also reporting to someone within the company and it is his responsibility to ensure that the people that are reporting to them, they are able to manage them and that work progresses, um, which is actually a good thing. Now, what is Beatrice doing outside work other than uh, being uh, taking part of the family? Are you volunteering somewhere? Are you is there something you're doing that is not uh, engineering related? Hey, what do I do outside there? Ah, I would say I don't know, but uh, any chance I get to 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 impact the life of the youth, I take it. I mentor young 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 engineers who come for attachment at place of work, but also outside the, the work and any chance I get to speak to someone who is confused. You see, when when I when I joined uh, when I finished my campus, I was not I was not sure of what I wanted in life, you see. And most of the young young people feel like that when they finish school. They don't know what to do. But I, I usually tell them, as you go along, as you do something, if you get something to do, just do it. Because when you go along, you'll find your purpose. And I think uh, as I interact with them, I get to motivate them and encourage them to actually not miss the steps that are there in life. Because you, you never know. This, these things that you do right now will make sense when you are five years ahead, that's when you look back and say, oh, so this thing contributed to where I am today. So I, I love talking to the youths and giving them 
moral and motivation and mentoring them. So this is what I do outside work. And that has been our conversation with uh, SCADA engineer Beatrice Terer. Until next time, we say thank you. Beatrice. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. <laughs>